And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Is there a way to enhance the brain in order to tap into the other realm, the realm of spirituality? Without a doubt. And I think this, you know, there was actually a wonderful uh, publication uh, that appeared just uh, January the 30th of this year that demonstrated the physical structural changes that are taking place, the functional changes in the brain that take place with meditation so that we can absolutely, through the practice of meditation and through the practice of prayer, change the brain and uh, make that brain more able to access what we're tr- the reason we're praying and meditating in the first place. So there are physical substrates in the brain. There are structures in the brain that deal with accessing spirituality, uh, spiritual pursuits, that give us that information, that give us that experience. And we can, just as you would uh, learn a golf stroke or learn a new language, the brain is adaptable and able to, through this process of neuroplasticity, able to gain access and more fundamentally uh, uh, achieve this ability that, you know, really we're all after. So, absolutely. I mean, you know, this concept of mind that might exist within the brain but also outside of the brain, the, the sort of the non-local mind, you know, is interesting, but it, it, to take us back a little bit, the brain functions, you know, based upon it, how its structures work. And those structures have now been defined that allow us the spiritual experience. So, yes, indeed. Tell me about vitamin D. seems to be a hot topic these days, especially D3. Well, yeah, D3 is, uh, of course, the active form of, of vitamin D, and, and you're right. You know, the I think what got the ball rolling was in November, the Institute of Medicine issued a report uh, which kind of castigated vitamin D in a sense saying that really we don't need much vitamin D you know, they came out with their recommendations. I understand this was not based upon any any scientific research. Uh, this was actually just based upon a couple of doctors who got together and uh, reviewed what they felt was the pertinent literature and then issued a report that was really so in the face of others of us who are practicing nutritional medicine. Basically, what they stated was that the estimated average requirement of vitamin D, for example, for a one-year-old was 400 units a day, which is exactly what they said for a 30-year-old, 50-year-old, 70-year-old, mm-hmm. and even an 80-year-old. Yeah, year old. they kept it the same, didn't they? And it's breathtaking. And the reason that they um, came up with these numbers it was really based upon the role of vitamin D in terms of bone building. Well, it turns out that vitamin D probably plays more, uh, activates more than a thousand genes in human physiology. And, for example, we know that vitamin D levels are very low in Alzheimer's disease, in, in Parkinson's disease, and in multiple sclerosis. My Huffington Post tomorrow actually deals with uh, vitamin D in uh, multiple sclerosis, but be that as it may, um, the, the idea, you know, they, they said that a toxic dosage of vitamin D would be 4,000 units. That would be, you know, a, a life-threatening kind of a toxic experience for a person. And yet, if George, if you were to go outside uh, with no clothes on, uh, aside from being arrested, uh, if it were daytime, uh, your body makes a thousand units of vitamin D every minute. You're outside in the sun, you, and you should be out in the sun for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right? And so the point is, according to the Institute of Medicine. Four minutes in the sun would provide to you a toxic dosage of vitamin D. Now, Jeez. that means that either God or Mother Nature or somewhere along the line or evolution, you know, however you, I don't think I left anybody out in that one, <laughs> uh, got it wrong. And I, and I tend to think that that's just not the way it is. Well, the story is actually a little bit more intriguing when you do a little Google research on the two doctors who championed the Institute of Medicine study. You know, it was as you might expect; it wasn't as forthright as it should have been. Was it sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies? Well, they are. Yeah. Uh, their research of is course. sponsored by those individ- the couple of uh, pharmaceutical companies that develop osteoporosis drugs. So, uh, go figure. <laughs> go figure. Yeah. But you know, God love them. Um, the, uh, a week after that report was issued, I was asked to go on Good Morning America, and uh, we chatted about this. And I did a, a segment talking about why vitamin D is so darn important 
And, um, you know, I really didn't get into the the whole politic of why these doctors had, had done, done what, what they, they did. Yeah. But I simply, you know, tried to make the point, A, that how preposterous it would be that four minutes in the sun would be toxic to you, number one. And number two, how desperately important vitamin D is for so many other functions in human physiology that have absolutely nothing to do with bone. For example, vitamin D is, as we talked about earlier, another epigenetic factor. Vitamin D modulates certain expression of our DNA. And in this case, in the brain, it turns on a specific gene that codes for something called cathelicidin. And what cathelicidin is, is the brain's uh, antimicrobial. It's, the, it's what sterilizes the brain and helps get rid of things like invading bacteria and invading uh, viruses. Mm-hmm. And that becomes very interesting uh, as of late when we see the new research that relates herpes virus to the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And again, I posted that on Huffington about a week and a half ago and got it was front page. The idea that herpes simplex type 1, the same virus that causes our fever blisters, is related to risk for Alzheimer's disease. And that one of the ways the brain gets rid of viruses is through the action of vitamin D. And that might very well explain why vitamin D levels are lowest in Alzheimer's patients compared to controls and why vitamin D levels are also low in things like multiple sclerosis because vitamin D helps rid the brain of these invading organisms. And, you know, it, it, it takes your breath away when something comes out. And my patients, you know, immediately after that Institute of Medicine report came out, came to my office and said, oh, my goodness, you've... You put me on 5,000 units of vitamin D. What were you thinking? What were you trying to do? And, <laughs> you know, and I'm explaining, look, um, where do we begin? You know, the, the research on vitamin D and much higher dosages of vitamin D is vast and uh, all-encompassing. And, you know, interestingly enough, there was a, a report from a Dr. John Cannell that actually made its way to Scientific American. He's a psychiatrist in California who's really been all over vitamin D. He's a member of the Vitamin D Council and is writing about it. And his interesting research points the finger uh, vitamin D deficiency right at causality in terms of autism. And what he says is really quite interesting. Fascinating. That those kids who are autistic come from higher income families, higher educated families who tend to keep their kids out of the sun. They come from cities as opposed to out in the country, mm-hmm. cities with tall buildings especially that shield the sun. Where they never get any sun, yeah. They come from places of uh, significant cloud cover compared to kids who do not get autism. More common in blacks who have less ability to manufacture vitamin D from the sun. And, uh, you know, very, very compelling arguments that the risk of, of uh, autism in Somalia, for example, is, is virtually non-existent. But when Somalis move to Sweden for, for various employments, they have kids that have dramatically high rates of autism. So so much that the Somalis call autism the Swedish disease. So, uh, again, it's this powerful role of vitamin D in so many other ways aside from just, you know, this you, idea you, it that it's It sounds like you, you would say vitamin D is critical to an individual. Absolutely. I mean, we're all over vitamin D. And, you know, the point is, it, it, it's so simple to regulate how much vitamin D a person requires. You give them a, a trial dosage. I usually start at 5,000 units of vitamin D3 each day. Mm-hmm. And then after a couple months, you check their blood and see where is the level of vitamin D. And if it's where it needs to be, then that's the right dosage. If they need more, you give them more. If they've got too much, you cut back a little bit. It's just very straightforward. Well, how do we know that those levels, you know, when you take a blood test and then you get it and you look at it and compare it and they've got the, the, the guides of what the average should be, how do we know that's right? Well, it's a very good question. Most of the time, what is considered normal is, in fact, average, meaning they would take a large group of people, say a 1,000 people, and they would construct a bell curve, and that within one standard deviation of the middle of that bell curve would be considered a normal level. Mm-hmm. But with vitamin D, <clears throat> a lot more research went into it uh, in terms of studying what a certain level of vitamin D does in human physiology. As a matter of fact, in August of 2010, an incredible article was published in the journal Neurology. And what they did was they took uh, 49 patients with multiple sclerosis, and 25 were given vitamin D and 24 were not. 
And during this one-year study, the group uh, given vitamin D, at times during that one year, had, the dosage of vitamin D was up to 40,000 units a day. Wow. And what they found was, <clears throat> interestingly enough, the calcium levels in the blood during that uh, study, even at the highest levels of vitamin D, remained perfectly the same, perfectly normal. The big fear that people talk about vitamin D is, oh, your blood calcium is going to go real high. Right, right. Well, in this study, it, it didn't, didn't happen, number one. And number two, during the, the one year, those individuals who were on the high dosage vitamin D compared to those who did not had 41% fewer recurrences of multiple sclerosis. And here's what's exciting That's about that. That's huge. It is huge. It's huge when you compare it to the standard accepted treatment for multiple sclerosis, which is the use of drugs called interferons. Mm -hmm. And interferons are associated with about a 28% risk reduction in new events annually. That's what they use to try to fight off hepatitis C, right? A another form of, of interferon. But okay. the point is, I mean, here is the best thing that we have going for us in terms of treating MS, only associated with about a 28% risk reduction of new events and about 78% of people taking that medication feel flu-like, as opposed to people taking vitamin D, which was incredibly cheap. I mean, it was like $30 for the year and had no real side effects. That is, that is that's something else. And as a matter of fact, that's going to be my, uh, my Huff post that's been written, and you'll see that tomorrow. At the end of it, I, I say how incredible it is that the this powerful treatment can be something people could get at the health food store or even from the good old sun itself. Why don't we have these numbers, these rates in our bodies from the get? Don't we have these numbers, these rates in our bodies from the get go? Um, Where do we fall short? I'm not sure I'm following you. Numbers well, well, of what? Well, we 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 give ourselves vitamin D. Right. Why don't we have that within ourselves already? Well. Look what's happened. We have an amazingly powerful and efficient way of manufacturing vitamin D so that we don't need supplements, and it's our skin. In the presence of ultraviolet B, the human body is extremely efficient at manufacturing vitamin D at the rate of a 1,000 units per minute when we're out in the sun. But what happened? We now wear clothing. We wear sunscreen. And uh, we wear sunglasses because it turns out that even the retina is able to manufacture vitamin uh -huh. D, which has direct access to the brain. So what happened is, you know, over the past 1,000 years or, or so, 1,500 years, we've started wearing, 2,000 years, wearing clothing. And I, I, I'm not making... <laughs> yeah, you're there. not advocating us to run around no, nude. I'm not, but the point is that's what's changed. So we've put clothing on a physiology that was adapted to being naked in in you know running uh, so in the, the beginning of time. Yeah, that's right. When we had wonderful production of vitamin D day in and day out. So we altered what was natural, which is the story of of modern society, isn't it? I mean, think of all the doctors who are advocating the so-called caveman diet to take us back to a time when we're living in harmony with our genes. We are not living in harmony with our genes now. We are, you know, we're sending signals to our genes that are absolutely perverse, and it's why our society is as sick as it is. Should everybody sit in a uh, hyperbaric ch oxygen oxygen chamber? <laughs> well, we we do a lot of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, mostly for neurological conditions. We know that it's a powerful way of enhancing how the brain works and uh, allowing patients to recover from, from various types of injury. Is it good for everybody? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know that uh, out in California where you are, it's very popular to, uh, you know, there are places you can go and just have hyperbarics as part of an anti-aging right. 